I know it's been a while. We had uh, we had a week off due to paving the parking lot, and then of course we had our business meeting last Wednesday. But I, uh, of course, I a few weeks ago, if you were here or if you saw it online or whatever, we talked about about the woman that rides the beast and Babylon. And I want to say this by way of getting started that uh, Babylon, if you if this will help you in prophecy, Babylon is a system a religious system, a government, and a city. Amen. They're all three called that. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's, a, there's going to be an empire Babylon, there's going to be a religious Babylon, and there's going to be a city Babylon. And uh, by way of introduction here on the paper, Revelation chapter 18 and 19 begins the judgment on Babylon. I didn't go, we're not going to touch uh, chapter 18 if you want to read that. Chapter 18, it just gives you the, the destruction of Babylon the city. Babylon the city will be rebuilt. Matter of fact, I'll take it a step farther. It already has been rebuilt. Um, there's a prophecy, I'm sure Brother Mike and Dad could elaborate on that as well. But if you read Isaiah, uh, I believe it's Isaiah 14. If you read Jeremiah 50, it talks about an instantaneous destruction of that city that has never come to pass yet. And so that tells me that the city will be a hub in the future. I'm going to give you a few facts about that. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but in 1983, Saddam Hussein ordered uh, Babylon, the city, to be rebuilt. Matter of fact, he, can, he imagines himself as a dis direct descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. He called himself Nebuchadnezzar II. Like Nebuchadnezzar, Hussein had his name inscribed on the bricks which were placed directly on top of the ruins that were some 2,500 years old. He then, uh, if you want to go online, you can see pictures of it. He made a tremendous mound and built a palace on top of it so it would overlook the city. Um, of course, his, uh, his plans got halted in 2003 by the United States uh, by our invasion there in 2003. And, but I want you to make this point to you. In 2006, the UN... Officials and Iraqi leaders stated their intentions to restore Babylon to a cultural center. And this is also interesting. It has been rumored. See, the United Nations is talking about moving, getting out of the United States, and I wish it would. I'm just going to be honest with you. I wish it would get so far out of the United States. We, I wish it would go to another planet. The United Nations, uh, in case you don't know this, the United Nations is a wicked thing. The, the Antichrist is going to come through that. I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced of that. And uh, but one of the but one of the sites that they're talking about moving to is Babylon. I find that interesting. So having said that aside, I believe the city will be like I said, the city somewhat rebuilt. Now there's no people inhabiting it right now. That doesn't mean it couldn't be in the future. Now moving on and and, and talking to you about what I said this was about about the return of the king. Um, when we come to Revelation chapter 19, when we come to verse seven. This is what the scripture says. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. <coughs> Excuse me. And he, he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I want to say this to you, and I hope I mentioned it before, but it's always good to keep this in mind. The church is not married to Jesus Christ right now. Here's why that's important, and, I, and this, what I'm getting ready to say is controversial, but I'm, say, I'm not saying it to be controversial. In a lot of Baptist, what we would call sister churches or what used to be sister churches, there's a doctrine that they preach and teach called the Mother Church Doctrine. And what they do is they say, you know, Christ is the husband and the church is the mother and, you know, children. In other words, people can't be saved unless the mother is in travail. The only thing's wrong with that is we're not married yet. Right. Right. Amen. Right. So if the church is having children, she's having them illegitimately. Right. Right. I've got Bible to back up what I just said. Now, uh, I, so we're not mother churchers. Whenever you hear people, and, and we have people that visit here that are friends and we're not trying to you know, cause splits and divisions. I've heard people say in their testimony, you know, well, the church is my mother. The church is not your mother. Church did not give birth to you. The Holy Ghost gave birth to you. We're not even married yet. 
The marriage of Christ. I have this down here. This is, no, never forget this. The marriage of Christ and the church follows the Jewish tradition. See, in the Greek mind, and I, that's what we're patterned after, the Greek mind, prophecy is prediction and fulfillment. But in the Hebrew mind, it's pattern. But God does things by pattern. Our whole unity or our, our union with Christ patterns the way he is with us, the way we are with him. It patterns the Jewish tradition of marriage. Now, I am not going to try to pronounce these Hebrew words that I have on the paper, but they are. What if you're looking at those going, wonder what those are, they're Hebrew words. They, they, are, per, they are each stage of a marriage ceremony. Uh, and the first one refers to the preliminary arrangements prior to the legal betrothal and a time of mutual commitment. In ancient times, I think this is interesting, a Jewish father chose a bride for his son. The two would sit together at a table with two glasses of wine, one for each of them. It would almost be like a, a feast or a festival. While the feast and festival goes on, the two go over to a table and they sit down and they commune together. I think this is interesting. After a time, even though the father has chose a bride for his son, they do not have to get married. If they do not choose to marry one another, they drink out of their own glass. As a sign, I don't choose you. But if they choose to marry one another, they drink out of each other's cup. That's real interesting when Jesus kept talking about drinking that cup. Makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Uh, John 18 and 11, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword. That was the night they came to arrest him. He said, The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So, moving on. So once they choose one another, they drink out of each other's cup. Then there's a marriage contract that's got to be signed long before they're married. That's called the ketubah. That's one I can't pronounce. The ketubah is a Hebrew word for a marriage contract that is signed by both the bride and the groom and states the obligations of the groom to the bride as far as what he will provide for her. It is legally binding and requires a divorce to break it. Even though this is an espousal or an engagement period, it requires a divorce to break it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. When Mary, was con when Mary conceived of the Holy Ghost, she was not married to Joseph. But Joseph talked about a divorce. You remember that? Matthew 1, 18 and 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse, the spouse means engaged. To Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, do you notice it called her her husband? But a moment ago, they said they were a spouse. It's because their contract was binding, even though they hadn't went through the ceremony yet. Yeah. Now, when it, I said this one time in our Sunday school back there, and you should have seen, I wrecked every kid's uh, a memory of a Christmas play when I actually told them what it means when it says Joseph meant to put her away. It means divorce. Yeah. Not willing to make her a public example, he was minded to put her away. Put her away means divorce, privily. In other words, he still loved her, and he didn't want to make an example out of her, but he was going to, his, in his mind, he was going to divorce her because they'd already entered into this contract. See, that's not like the Western world. You have to understand, like I said, what Dad said before, this is a Jewish book written by Jewish men. It's a Jewish culture. Now, Here's, here's the thing about that. Once the marriage contract is signed, notice it says here that the groom says what he's going to do. That's what the contract is. He's stating, I'm going to provide for you. I promise to provide for you. I promise to give you home and a shelter and all these things. Now, I want to say this. Jesus Christ, we find this out in the book of Hebrews, when he died on, when he died on Calvary, a testament went into effect, an agreement. We have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Well, you know as well as I do, a testament's not of any force while the testator liveth. In other words, everybody in here that's got a will, it's of no good to you right now. It goes into effect after you die. The covenant that, he, the covenant that was wrote out went into effect after his death. But he didn't stay dead. Praise God for that. The testator lived, but he had to die for it to go into effect. See, here's the thing about it. Uh, I say this a lot. It'd be good for us to go over and talk about what a covenant is. We're in a covenant with God. Covenant means he's made promises that he cannot break. 
That's what this marriage contract is. It's a covenant that cannot be broken. Then moving on, if I'm pr pronouncing this word, arusin, right, is the betrothal period. So once the contract has been signed, the groom would give the bride money. See, Jewish men bought their wives. Don't ever forget this. On the cross, Jesus Christ paid for you. He paid a price for us. He'd give the bride money or a valuable object such as a ring to seal their covenant vows. Now I want to show you something. Here's where knowing the Jewish traditions makes your Bible come alive. How many people in here remember? I know Brother Mike's taught on this and he's uh, already ahead of me. He knows where I'm going. How many of you remember the parable in Luke 15 about the woman that lost a piece of silver? You know why she had 10 pieces of silver? That's what was given to her from her groom. That's why she was sweating looking for it. She had lost one of those pieces. Those pieces is what paid for her. That's what that parable is about. Now, not only did he give her something valuable, they're considered married even though they don't live together. But they're just engaged and, and they do not, they've not yet engaged in a marital relationship. They've not consummated the marriage. During this period, I find this inter interesting, during this period, the groom was to prepare a place for his bride while the bride focuses on her personal preparations, the wedding garments and stuff. You know what the bride does all that time? She's just looking. And it could be as long as a year. I think a lot of times they said it was about a year. Now, what Brother Mike said a moment ago is true. The son went to prepare a place for his bride. A lot of times in the Jewish world, it was an addition onto his father's house. Now, this is gonna this is gonna be good. John 14, 3. This is the last thing Jesus says before he goes to the cross. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, although the bride knew to expect her groom after about a year, she did not know the exact day or the hour so she had to watch how many times did jesus keep saying i keep telling you watch 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 i know that people sit in church and say well they've been talking about this rapture business they've been talking about the second coming for a long time we're supposed to keep on talking about it because we're supposed to watch 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 now he could come earlier he could come later it was the now i like this this is interesting it was the father of the groom who gave the final approval for him to return and collect his bride. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Now, I said a minute ago, the, the groom gave something of value to the bride before he went away. We have been given the Holy Ghost as our down payment of what we're going to get. And I'll tell you what, I'm enjoying this down payment so good, I don't know if you want to be near me when I get the rest of what I, what's coming to me. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it says, in whom ye also trusted after that ye have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Earnest means that's what we got right now. If you buy a house and you put down earnest money, that's what you pay right now. When we receive the Holy Ghost, that's what he gave us right now. And I don't, I'm going to say, I, I believe you're going to say amen to this. I've been finding out it's been real valuable. Amen. Now, next comes uh, the Nisuin. If I'm saying that right, that's the actual marriage. It's the final step in the Jewish wedding tradition, which means to take. That's what that word means. At this time, the groom, with much noise and fanfare and romance, carries his bride home. They enter into what's called the hoopa, it's a canopy, and they recite a blessing over the wine, which is a symbol of joy, and finalize their vows. They consummate their marriage and live together as husband and wife, fully partaking of all the privileges of marriage. I always wondered why Jesus Christ at the Last Supper said, I'm not going to drink this wine with you. Look at Matthew 26, 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 
I think what he's saying is, I'll not drink this until I drink it on my wedding day. It's Wednesday night, but I'm about to shout. First, I want to say this. In the Jewish tradition, the parable, uh, the parable of the ten virgins, they're waiting on a marriage to take place. Uh, the, the bridegroom went forth at midnight. Or I'm not the bridegroom, I'm sorry. There was a forerunner that went out before him and called out and said, the bridegroom cometh. He made a lot of noise. That's what they did. They sent out somebody ahead that made a lot of noise, that they played music, and I mean, it was a big deal. And, it, you know, that's what they said. They said, the bridegroom comes. Of course, they got all got up and got ready. You know the parable, 10 were wise, 10 were foolish. I want to say this to you in case that parable has ever troubled you. That has nothing to do with the church. You know how I know that? There's ten virgins. Not any of them are getting married. Hello. That's a Jewish parable to Jewish people. So don't sweat that. Every, every time I've ever tried to press that into the church age, I've wrecked it every single time. It's not for us. It has to do with the... It's, it, see, there's going to be people called to that wedding that's not part of the bride. So the fact that the, the bridegroom goes forth and there's a shout and there's a lot of noise made, look what this says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The reason there's a shout and a trumpet is because he's come to get his bride. There's a lot of noise made about that. I had a fellow ask me the other day, and he was saved, and he said, do you think, he said, do you think everybody else will hear that trump? I said, I don't think so. I think that's a trump only saved people can hear. I, that's what I think. The scripture is clear that we are in, in the engagement part of the ceremony right now. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. He said, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. I underline the next part. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. That verse clearly teaches us we're not married yet. It's in, in this whole pattern thing, but we're sure to be. Amen. Now, Revelation 19 and 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I wrote here in italics, so who is called? Who's called? He said, right, blessed are they that are called. A bride doesn't have to be called because she's got a place. Any marriage that I have ever been a part of as far as that, we never had to send an invitation to the bride, not one time. You send invitations to the family members and the friends. Now, here's what's interesting. John the Baptist was smart enough to know he wasn't part of the bride. Right. Amen. Look what he said in John 3, 28 and 29. When they was asking him if he was the Christ, he said, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. I have the next part underlined on purpose. He said, But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. I have heard some men say they thought that John the Baptist would be the best man. I will say this. He evidently, evidently John had enough discernment to know he wasn't part of the bride. He said, I don't have the bride, and I'm not part of the bride. But he said, I am a friend of the bridegroom. That tells me he'll be invited. Now, not only do you invite friends, but you invite family. Who is Jesus Christ's family? It's the nation of Israel. Don't ever forget this, and I know you haven't. Jesus Christ is a Hebrew. His family are Hebrews. They are the ones called to the marriage supper. See, and the rapture and everything, you got to remember the rapture is just for the bride. Old Testament saints, I'm, I don't want to lose anybody here, Old Testament saints do not get resurrected in that. It's not for them. It's the dead in Christ. Abraham's not part of the dead in Christ. He lived a long time for Christ. But here's the thing about it. They will be raised too. Now here's something I find interesting. God promised Abraham that he would inherit that land, but not while he was living. Did you ever notice that? He said, I give this land to you and to your seed, 
But the Bible plainly tells us in Hebrews, he never inherited it while he was living. Somebody said, did God, did God jip him on that? No, he'll inherit it when he gets resurrected. See, Moses, God told Moses, you can't go into that land, but he went in. Uh, what, would, what would you call the Mount of Transfiguration? He was just standing there as a glorified man. So, Abraham, who, who would the family be called? Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, Leah, Rachel, the 12 patriarchs, and so on. They're the family that's called. Now, how many people have heard, and I, if you, some of you probably never heard this, but how many people have heard over years ago, they say, well, the Lord's coming to get the church, and we're going to go up, and there's going to be the marriage supper, the Lamb, we're coming back. That can't be so. You've got to have a marriage before you can have a supper. We don't have a marriage until Revelation 19. So that tells me in Revelation 6, 7, and so on, there's no marriage supper going on then. It takes place later on. I'll tell you something else, and that may be, uh, maybe people will think I'm a heretic. That's all right. I've been thought of worse. Marriage supper of the Lamb won't take place in heaven. It'll take place on earth. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's going to take place in heaven because there's earthly people going to be involved. Revelation 19 and 11. These are controversial verses, I know that. But hey, you know what? I'm a controversial guy anyway. And I will say this. I'm never going to be afraid of my Bible. I'm not cutting things out because people have difficulties with it. The Bible says what it says. Revelation 19 and 11. He said, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The phrase, I saw heaven opened, means literally people on earth could look up and the veil that's between us and glory, God pushed it back. What a sight that'll be. It means the veil between heaven and earth. In other words, people on earth could see what was coming down from glory. Number two, the next phrase, behold a white horse. This phrase identifies the rider as a king. In ancient times, kings were presented on white horses or they were in a chariot that was being pulled by white horses. Not just any kind of horse, only the white horse. Now, if you remember from way back, the Antichrist was seen coming on a white horse. You remember that? The first seal that was broken and the beast told John, said, come and see. Behold, a white horse went out and there was a rider that had a crown and he had a bow with no arrows. Somebody said, why is that? That's Satan mocking, trying to look like. Christ. He's called faithful and true. These are obviously other names given of Jesus Christ. The Bible here says, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He's coming to overthrow the beast and his empire. Don't ever forget this. The beast is a usurper trying to raise up in front of. Now, we've said this before. How many times, how many, do you remember a parable where the Lord talked about a king? That, if I'm saying it right, if I'm not, please forgive me. I'm, I'm just going off my memory. But the, the parable of the king that sent forth an ambassador of peace, and they wouldn't have it. So the king came and destroyed them. That's what he's talking about. See, Jesus Christ came the first time to make peace. We have the, mes we have the ministry of reconciliation. Every Sunday I pray to people that, or I preach to people that aren't saved, make peace. Christ has made peace. God is standing with open arms to make peace. But if you won't make peace, you're going to have war. Right. Yeah. Revelation 19, 12 through 13 says, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His eyes were as a flame of fire. That has to do with holiness. Fire and holiness go together. You remember a verse, there's a verse, I believe it's in Hebrews, it says our God is a consuming fire. It's because he's holy. Uh, holiness devours too. Many crowns on his head, again, because he's a king. And also later on we find that he's called king of kings. Now there's a part where we have to dip into the Old Testament if we want to understand it. It says his clo he is clothed with a vesture. A vesture is clothing, a garment. Dipped in blood. This is not his blood. His blood is on the mercy seat. Amen. 
This is the blood of his enemies. Now, how could I make that statement? We have to jump back to Isaiah 63 and read these verses. The prophet said, Who is this that cometh from Edom? By the way, Edom means red. With dyed garments from Basra, that this, uh, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. So the first three questions were made by the prophet. The answer is getting ready to be given by the one coming. He said, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. I, as far as I know, that, that only fits one person. He said, wherefore, then the next question, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I hate, to, I hate to use this illustration, but it's the only one I think we can connect with. How many people have ever seen the episode of, of Lucy when she's making the wine? Yeah, that's how they made wine in those days. I don't think it's made like that now, but they literally had a great big like tub, a round tub that they threw all the grapes in, and people literally rolled up garments and went in and just pressed them. They, stepped, they, they just stomped them. They stomped them and pressed it out. So that's what the Lord is saying here. The reason my garments are red is because I've been stomping <laughs> He said, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat. He answers, he said, I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the people, there was none with me. For I will tread them. So we're not talking about grapes. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. I want to stop right here and say this. We've got a Savior that's merciful, that's long-suffering, that's full of grace. But if you leave off His holiness, His righteousness, His wrath and, uh, against sin, then you have an idol. You don't have God. You can't take one side and leave off the other side. Matter of fact, you can't really appreciate grace till you understand how much God hates sin. When you understand how much God hates sin, then you can appreciate God's grace. So that's why his garment is red. It's red with the blood of his enemies. Now, it finishes up. I think this is interesting. It calls him by what he was called before he was ever a human. His name is called Capital, the Word of God. That's what he was known in the beginning. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Revelation 19, 14 through 16, it says, And the armies which were in heaven, so he comes out as a king, and his armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's, that's a uh, reference back to what we just read in Isaiah 63. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now all this war that we just described is touched on in 2 Thessalonians. That's what I have on the bullet point here. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10 says, And to you, so I'm, yeah, I said 2 Thessalonians. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You understand now why I'm begging people to get saved? Because I know what's ahead of them. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So again, Isaiah 63 is referred when it says, He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 19, 17 through 18. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, 
and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and, and bond, both small and great. Somebody said, that sounds like strange language. It would if you don't understand that it's a reference to the battle of Armageddon. This is a reference to the battle fought at Armageddon. To understand that, we've got to jump back to Revelation 16, 12 through 14, where it describes that battle, or, or the, set, the setting up of that battle. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the, or, of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Jesus referenced this in, when he was on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24 when he said this, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together also. The battle of Armageddon. Let me say this, or let me uh, put this in terms we understand. And I think you already do, but the battle of Armageddon is the last battle, the greatest battle fought between evil and good between Satan and Christ. Now, as the, as the angel pours out his vial, there's a spirit, that, there's spirits that go out into all the world, and notice it draws the entire world, though, whatever's left at that time, because we're talking about the tribulation, there's gonna be a lot of people dying that. So whatever's left at that time, it's gonna draw them to one place. It's gonna be the greatest world war, probably, that's ever been seen. And as it all comes together, and they, and, and as they, and the reason it's being, they're being drawn together, they're going to come together against Jerusalem to smash it. It's going to, the devil's going to try to bring the entire world to Jerusalem's gates and smash it down. And when they think that they're going to go in and get that done, there's going to be a light come out of the sky that's going to knock their eyes out. See, here's, I love this. See, a lot of times we, you know, and I, I, I believe, like you believe, I'm sure. I, I'm, I'm going to support government that's going to be friendly to Israel. Amen. You're looking at a friend of Israel. Amen. And I understand, but I, but I understand that we have leaders that don't, under, that some of them that don't understand that. And all, it bothers me because I know that God takes that real personally when we, when, when we could help them, but we don't help them, or we try to make them give up land. I, I'm going to say this. It's a terrible thing when the United States tries to make Israel give up land. We've had previous presidents, both Democrat and Republican, try to make them give up land, and we suffered for it every time. Amen. Katrina happened right on the heels of a president trying to make them give up land. Amen. Don't you never forget that. So it's bad. The Lord, the Lord said in one of the Old Testament prophets, He said, I'll judge any nation that makes them part my lands. So we gotta keep our, you got to keep your hands off Israel's land. But a lot of times, I think, too, we think that it's our responsibility to protect them. Well, let me tell you something. God said that in the last days, he said he would go out and fight for them as in the days of old. He will preserve them, not us. Now, I, I want to be, I, I'm, like I said, I want our leaders to do everything in their power to help Israel. But when Israel's finally saved, it ain't going to be from Washington. It ain't going to be from our political system. It's going to be the kingdom of heaven. Amen that comes down out of the sky and says, oh, no, 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 you, you've, you, 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 no, no, you've done made me mad. Right. Amen. And so that's what the Battle of Armageddon is all about. The entire world's brought together on the doorstep to smash Israel, to smash, to smash Jerusalem. Somebody said, why is that? Because it's prophecy. See, when God sets his name or he sets his purpose somewhere, Satan's going to attack that. That's why. There ain't a city in the world like Jerusalem. Do you know that Jerusalem's been completely destroyed 11 times and rebuilt? Amazing to me, it keeps coming back. Yeah. Nobody's talking about Nineveh today. That was a pretty great city. Jerusalem can't stay off the map. Why is that? Because it's prophecy. Now, so as the world comes together and they're going to try to smash Jerusalem, you've got to remember this too. People are going to be so deluded by the Antichrist, that when Christ comes with his armies, they're going to take up arms against him and think they can win. Now, I like this. You might, this might not do nothing for you, but it does a lot for me. 
From what I've read of the scriptures, the Bible says that the Lord gets this victory by himself. Now, it also says, he said he tread them down like a wine fat. So what he's going to do is he's going to allow the devil to get them all in one place. When the Lord comes down, he's going to trod them down like smashing grapes and their blood is going to go on his raiment while you and I cheer him on. Somebody said, this ain't doing nothing for me. It will in the future when you've when you got a front row seat to it. Amen. Now, I, I, it does something for me because, you know what I, no, finally we're going to have government on the earth that's ran right. Amen. He said he, he's going to go forth. The Bible said that a sharp sword goes out of his mouth. I think that is a reference to the power of his speech literally speaking them into destruction. Another place that talks about the brightness of his coming would destroy many. But the Lord, whatever, whoever goes out there to fight him is going to be, is going to be a big time loser. And he's going, to stri- he's going to stomp them down like a person stomping on grapes. Now, not only that, the carnage will be so f- severe everywhere that an angel stands and calls for all the fowls in heaven to come down and eat it. Matter of fact, by one place the Bible said the Lord said the Lord said it was a feast He prepared for the fowls of the air. And that's what the Scripture means when it says, "Eat the flesh of kings and of captains." It's a it's a feast prepared for them by God. Now, Armageddon in the New Testament, as I said, that that term means the last battle fought between good and evil at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I like the next part, the last two verses, and we'll come to a close. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. See, I didn't pull that out of thin air. That, the Bible tells us right there they're going to try to defeat him. <clears throat> and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped the image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh i'm going to end you with this and it's going to segue me into next week this is the end of the beast and his empire and it is the beginning of the kingdom of heaven on earth now i'm going to say this it gets me a little excited This was God's purpose all along to get his government up there down here. Adam and Eve could have done it all along when they fumbled the football and it's taken all this time. But really, when you understand that, then your Bible makes more sense. The Bible is about a kingdom. The earth is a colony of heaven. That's why Jesus said, pray this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what? Someday, Jesus Christ is going to get that done. Adam couldn't get it done, but Jesus Christ will get it done. I say praise his holy name. I'm going to to teach you next week about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They are not the same thing. And if you don't understand that, a lot of gospel verses don't make a lot of sense. When I got a hold of this, it changed my Bible for me. Tremendously. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't bore you. Stand to your feet. Brother Brock, dismiss us in a word of prayer.